them or anything? No, I'm good. Um, but since I do work for the federal government and, and I am an official bureaucrat, I have to do paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> there is a um, evaluation form that Quality Virginia wants us to get filled out and get responses for. I have uh, just a couple sign-in sheets here. If you'd like to get more information about Equality Virginia and if you'd like for them to contact you with um, some more information on uh, some of the issues and things that are affecting Virginia, um, please fill that out. They all the if you would like more information about you. the mission of Equality of Virginia and what they're working on, um, I have this handy dandy uh, flyer. Maybe you can pass those on. This is intimidating to see all these evaluation forms. This evening. <laughs> <laughs> Take some bar. Hey, talking. You're not She's got the to camera on too. It's like <laughs> what are they going to do? Fire me? Are they going to dock my pay? I don't think. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I just want to say uh, good morning and thank you very much for inviting me here to speak with you. I'd like to thank uh, First Presbyterian for the invitation. I'd like to thank Buster especially for um, coordinating this with Equality Virginia. I'd also like to give a shout out to Equality Virginia and especially Trace Hernandez who did all the coordination for this and who's taken over uh, oversight of the uh, Speakers Bureau. Um, and. Uh, so just a couple of housekeeping notes. We've got the um, evaluation forms going around, some of the other uh, things going around. Equality Virginia would like to get a group photo afterwards, so anybody that's comfortable uh, being in a photo with me, um, appreciate just uh, sticking around for just a second so we can get a photo of everybody, I guess to prove that we were here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so by way of introduction, I would just like to ask a few questions. By show of hands, how many of you are Washington Nationals fans? Okay, there's a few of us. Yeah. Kind of uneven season, but you know. Um, how many of you are parents? Okay, it's quite a few of us. How many of you served in the military? Really? Oh, I'm the only one. How many of you work for the federal government? All right, a lot of, a lot of uh, federal employees. And how many of you would turn, attend church? I don't know where they're well, oh, wow. So as you see, we have a lot in common. And myself, I'm also a private pilot, and I have a little boat. Um, it's like a sunfish, but it's a different brand. That I love to sail around on Gunston Bay, over by Fort Belvoir. Um, I have two children. I live in West Springfield, Virginia, and I am a transgender woman. And a transgender person is somebody who grows up knowing that their body doesn't match who they feel that they are inside, their internal sense of self. Many transgender people eventually decide that they must live their lives in accordance with their internal sense of self, regardless of the physical appearance of their bodies. And I'll also note that the term transgender also encompasses a very broad spectrum of gender expression. So there's people that identify as non-binary. They don't identify as male or female. They usually use uh, them or their uh, pronouns. There's people that uh, identify as dual gender. Um, sometimes they feel more feminine, sometimes more masculine, and they may um, vary how they identify depending on the moment. And there's probably a, as many uh, definitions as there are people. So sometimes it gets a little complicated. I say that's great. Make me work for it because everybody has the right, everybody should be able to express themselves and be appreciated and recognized for how they feel inside, not what somebody else dictates that they should be. So. No one has been able yet to figure out what causes people to be transgender. There's a lot more research and uh, scientists are getting a lot more um, theories and, and information, but no one has really been able to identify the root cause and nobody has been able to identify how to make the brain match the body. So many people do the next best thing they can and make the body match the brain. 
or live their lives and their social presentation because that's how everybody else sees us that's in congruence with how they know they are inside. So they, they make the external match the internal because they can't go the other way around. Understanding what it's like to be transgender can be hard or understanding uh, the transgender experience can be very difficult. Frankly, sometimes I can't get my head around it and I've been living with it for 50 years. <laughs> so it's very understandable that some people might not be comfortable um, with it and people tend to see things through their own experience and their own lenses and it's very hard for us to get outside of that and see other people's experiences unless we've lived it ourselves. So I knew there was a mismatch between what I felt inside and what I saw on the outside when I was about four years old. Um, talking to my friends and support groups and things like that, four is about the age where most trans people know that something's different. Um, and they start feeling that friction or that dysphoria between the inside and the outside. So, everything I've read about effective public speaking and communicate with, communicating with people says, tell a story. So, I offer myself as a case study in what it's like to be a transgender person and my experience. And I will caution that this is only my experience. It's a sample population of one. And there's a saying that once you know one trans person, you know one trans person. <laughs> <laughs> but this is my story, and I want to tell you about a night in Afghanistan. On February 6, 2006, I deployed to Afghanistan with the 10th Mount Division as the deputy personnel officer for a multinational task force of about 20,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, civilians, and contractors. We also had a Canadian brigade and several other international forces with us. For that deployment, I packed some items in a shipping container. I took a couple duffel bags with my gear. I carried a small rucksack with me for things I would need during the three days of travel. And on my body, I had my most important things, my wallet, my passport, my ID card, pictures of my family, and those kind of things. And I carried a secret. I protected the things that I carried with me. I protected my equipment. I had my pistol on a lanyard tied to my belt. I kept my wallet and my important documents in a pocket that had a flap. Uh, the button down. I made sure I always knew where my um, my luggage was and things like that. Um, I was on a trip where uh, this colonel, the, our luggage got put on the wrong aircraft and he had $3,000 worth of rugs in his bags. And I spent a few days trying to track that down. So I made sure I knew where my stuff went. I protected my stuff. But most of all, I protected my secret. My secret would get me kicked out of the army if anyone found out. Not only would it cost me my security clearance in my career, but maybe even my family. It would expose me to ridicule. And it would lay bare the sham of a life that I've been living. And it would expose how deeply flawed and worthless I felt I was. My secret wasn't that I was a double agent. I wasn't collaborating with a foreign power. I wasn't engaged in corruption. I hadn't stolen anything or hurt anyone. I wasn't taking drugs or having an affair or anything like that. What was my secret? I was disguised as a man. And it was a really good disguise. I've been in disguise ever since I was four years old and realized that being a boy just didn't feel right. I saw what happened to sissies. So I put on the disguise. I didn't want to get beaten up all the time. I didn't want to be taunted all the time. I wanted to have friends. It was the 1960s, and racism, homophobia, and misogyny were alive and well, and disagreements were often settled with fists. The problem was that it was very hard for me to wear that disguise all the time. And I dreamt about what it would be like to be able to take it off, just even for a minute. And I would find small opportunities to take the disguise off, just briefly. And when I did, I covered my tracks carefully so no one would ever find out. 
I was careful about how I spoke, how I moved, my gestures, my speech, how I dressed, every little thing so I wouldn't telegraph my secret. I was on guard all the time. I was sneaky as a burglar and cutting as a spy. Transgender people have disproportionately served in the military, and eventually after college, I enlisted as a journalist in the Army. And surprisingly, it turned out that I liked it. And then I fell in love. Love conquers all, or so they say, so surely it would conquer gender dysphoria. <laughs> in 1992, I went to officer candidate school, and I was commissioned as an infantry officer, and I got married. And I was deeply in love. Meanwhile, I find that I was capable of more than I had ever known, and I thrived in a culture where ability and talent was re rewarded, where ability and accomplishments were rewarded, and especially rewarded with respect that I always craved. And surely I could be content with this life and be the man that everybody thought I was. A few, a few years later, we had a girl, or we had a boy and then a girl, and they're still Wonderful and amazing people, and I, just, I love them to death. You wanted to keep me up till midnight last night. <laughs> <laughs> and we got busy with family and friends and activities, and my career was going really well, and we were involved in our church, and just and many things. It just really kept us busy. <clears throat> and I got promoted and moved on and took jobs with more and more responsibility. <clears throat> Which brings me to that night in Afghanistan. And it really doesn't matter which one, because there were so many that were exactly the same. I had it easy. I was on Bagram Air Base, which is a really big base in Afghanistan, um, especially compared to those that were at the combat operating posts. I had many amenities, and I had a room that was heated, air-conditioned, and I even had internet and cable TV, a few channels of uh, Armed Forces uh, Network. So the Olympics were on in 2006. And the only thing that AFN got at the times that I was awake was curling. <laughs> so I was like way more curling than I ever saw in my entire life. And I actually even sort of got where I could understand a little bit of what they were doing. Who knew? Anyway, I digress. And uh, while I was in Afghanistan, the second half of my deployment, I had the perfect roommate because he was... Uh, the night chief of operations, so he worked nights, I worked days. We never saw each other except at the chapel on Sundays. So one thing that really stayed with me from my deployment was the fallen comrade ceremonies where casualties would be brought from the mortuary on Bagram to the airfield where they would start the journey back to the United States. And thousands of people on, Afghan, or on Bagram would stop what they were doing, come to Disney Drive, line Disney Drive shoulder to shoulder, <clears throat> and rend our arms as the flag draped shipping containers went by in the back of Humvees. It was a very solemn um, procession. And one of the things, one of the areas of responsibility that I was, um, that were in my portfolio was casualty operations. And I would, every day when I came in, I would look on a whiteboard, we had to see um, if there's any casualties, killed in action, wounded in action, or um, Afghans killed or wounded. And when there was a casualty, I would get the officer enlisted record brief, review it, and I would usually take it to the commanding general, whoever was uh, running the, uh, the floor at that particular time. And as I scanned through, I'd look to see <clears throat> just to try to get a um, sense of who this person was. Um, <clears throat> because I never wanted it to be just a piece of paper. And obviously it's, you know, it made an impact. Um, So after usually about a 14 hour or so day of meetings and reports and slides and um, reviewing awards and promotion packets and calling back to the states for replacement officers as people came in and out and, and helping um, 
navigate the career progression, that type of thing, because, oh, and we had a brigade in, in Iraq, too, that we were also dealing with, and uh, operations back at Fort Drum, so it was very busy. Um, after all that, I would come back to my room, and then I had nothing left to distract me, and the loneliness descended. And there was a lot of grief just <clears throat> over the, the utter senselessness of the war. And the things that the Taliban and people did to each other was just so horrific, so horrific. And it was daily. It was just nonstop, every day. And you, and you just left with, how could people do this to each other? And of course, I was. Alone, I was missing a year of my kid's life. I was cut off from my friends, my neighbors. Um, this is my little Kleenex or something. Um, you know, so. I had all the things that everybody has to make them feel sad during a war, <laughs> and my secret would intrude upon me. I had nothing left to distract myself from thinking about it. It never left me alone. Every hour of every single day for my entire life, I felt this friction. By 2006, when I was deployed, somewhere in my mind, I knew the die was cast. And I knew that I was full blown transgender, and the only way to find some level, level of peace would be to transition. But I desperately wanted to do anything I could to avoid that, anything. After decades of seeing and hearing how trans people were dehumanized, ridiculed, and discriminated against, I had internalized the negativity, and I developed a profound self-loathing. Self I hated the fact that I had this beautiful feminine force within me, constantly trying to express herself over the objections of the male self I had constructed. I saw no way out, none. And I felt utterly and entirely alone. I was locked in a life and death struggle I couldn't share with anybody. And I prayed and prayed that God would show me a path and a way out. But when I cried out, Surely, God, this is not what you have in store for me. All I heard was quiet. <clears throat> the only way I could see out was a loaded pistol that I kept within arm's reach all the time while I was deployed. Some nights, I would hold it in one hand, and I'd hold the magazine in the other hand, and I would think, I have a solution right here in front of me. It's in my hands. But I couldn't do that to the people that I love. And the feminine force within me kept insisting that she get a chance to live too, even if only briefly. When I was in my 20s, I had a dream that's as vivid as any experience I can <clears throat> think of. And Jesus came to me in my dream and said, all he said was, It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So on those nights, that's what I'm going to do. It's all I had. So I kept telling myself tomorrow. I'll go one more day, and if I can't handle it anymore, I'll do it tomorrow. And I kept stringing it together a few years of tomorrows. So the woman inside of me, my fears were on a collision course. And I was depressed and I was struggling to find a way to make my life work. And it was taking a big toll on everyone I love. 
And one night, my wife tearfully said to me, if you can't figure out this gender thing, I don't know if I can stay married to you. And I realized I was not the parent my kids deserved. I realized I was already losing all of the things I was afraid of losing if I transitioned. So I'll spare you the details, but attorney, I'm sorry. Um, so on my second visit to perhaps the most experienced gender therapist in this area, I asked her who she saw in front of her. Someone still trying to figure it out, or someone who had already made up her mind. And she looked at me and said, you've already made up your mind. And I, I broke down. I mean, I lost it. Um, he was admitting that defeat in a 50-year fight. And uh, I was terrified of what was ahead. But a turning point for me was when I first met living, breathing, actual transgender women and people in front of me who were successful and happy and their families, most of them, some of them are intact, some weren't. Um, and I've met just wonderful people who opened their hearts and opened their minds and their homes <coughs> to me. And for the first time ever, I saw that it was possible to survive this. And that made a huge difference. My friends in the support groups warned me that nothing is guaranteed when one embarks on, embarks on transition. And I heard stories of broken relationships, lost careers, loss of contact with children, harassment, and so on. But I also knew people who transitioned with minimal disruption. No one could predict my outcome. My friend Connie describes it as if one's, story is, one's life story is laid out on a Scrabble board. You take your hand and you go and flip the Scrabble board up in the air and all the pieces come down and you have no idea where they're going to land. They might land pretty close to where they started from. They might be scattered all over the place and pieces might be missing. Blogger Clara Barnhurst wrote, Dealing with the devil we know until we can't is consistent with another tooth of transition. Nobody does it if they can avoid it. It's disruptive, it's dangerous, and it's incomprehensible. Nobody wants to make that play. It's the move of the desperate and the hopeless. The only person that takes a chance like that is somebody with nothing to lose. That was me. So not knowing where my journey would take me, I moved forward. Resolved to love my family no matter what, and try to do the best to meet this challenge with integrity. I was terrified, and only the pain of not acting propelled me. People often say it takes courage to transition, but I felt like someone who had fallen off a ship in the middle of the ocean, and I was just kicking and swimming, trying to keep my head up, keep my nose out of the water. I was scared. I didn't feel courage whatsoever. But I kept coming back to the fact that Jesus promised me that I'd be okay. So each time I took another step out of the water, and as Barner has pointed out in her excellent article, no one can really define transition, and we don't even know what it looks like until we embark on the journey. After all, what it means to be a woman or a man is different for each woman and man. Philosopher Albert Camus, who I probably just mangled his name because I can't speak French, um, a little aside, my mom's from England. She emigrated to the United States just because she couldn't learn French and knew she had to learn French. <laughs> Um, Albert Camus said, "If I try to see, the, see if I try to, I'm sorry, if I try to see this self of which I feel sure, if I try to define, summarize it, it, is nothing but water slipping through my fingers. I can sketch one by one all the aspects it's able to assume, all those likewise that have been attributed to it, its upbringing, this origin, this ardor, or these silences." this nobility or this vileness, but the aspects cannot be added up. Self is a very elusive thing. Or as American civil rights activist and writer James Baldwin put it, folks can change their ways as much as they want to, but I don't care how many times you change your ways, what's in you is in you and it's got to come out. That pretty much captures my story. Transition took hours and hours of therapy and support from families and allies and help from doctors and clergy and tens of thousands of dollars of out-of-pocket medical expenses and gallons and gallons of tears. When I began living publicly and officially as a woman on August 13, 2016, almost overnight, I no longer needed medication for depression, 
I stopped taking medication for my ulcer. My blood pressure returned to normal. I stopped having anxiety attacks. And people started using terms like radiant and tell me, I've never seen you smile so much. And they said, oh, I was really worried about you before, but you look great now. It was dramatic. I was finally free of the shame and the guilt that I've been living with for decades. And that is what is so toxic, the shame and the guilt. This isn't my script, my, but um, I prepare remarks. But you know, right now we're seeing more and more women and men discussing openly their experiences of se sexual assault, which they've kept locked up for decades. And I can relate because in the early 1980s, I was attacked at a party. I was held down on a bed with the guy's arm in a cast across my throat. And I never talked about it until 2018. So today, here I am. And I can't say it's been entirely without rough spots, but I'm so glad that I took the chance. And every day, I thank God that I'm finally able to be me and just be here and, and actually live. It's amazing. Unfortunately, this is not true for everyone. In many states, including Virginia, it's perfectly legal for, to deny people housing or jobs simply because they're transgender. Economic disparities are well documented. Most LGBTQ people have experienced harassment and discrimination because of who they are. Transgender children who only want to go to school and blend in with their peers are vilified or forced to engage in high profile court cases in which every detail of their young lives are debated and dissected on the national stage. Just this week, a friend with a transgender, beautiful, just happy, gorgeous little girl, and in, in, she's a, in middle school. Uh, in the Hampton area, I believe, they had a um, they had a uh, lockdown drill, and she said that the teacher she was the girl was standing there for almost a half hour. All the other kids had gone either to the girls' locker room or the boys' locker room, and they stood there for a half hour debating which locker room she should go to or where she should go. They finally decided to put her in the hallway, facing the wall, like she was in timeout. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? The Army has an expression, train as you fight, because you're going to fight as you train. Can you imagine if there was an active shooter or some other emergency, and they were standing there trying to figure out which locker room to put this kid in? Each year, about two dozen people, mostly women of color, are murdered simply because they're transgender. And it looks like 2018 is going to be a record year for that. The Transgender Day of Remembrance is always on November 20th. So um, I would ask you, please, if it's in your heart to attend a service for that. Many times that's the only memorial some of these women get. And it's the only time their, their real names and their real identities are firm. So a study after study shows that respectful inclusive environments significantly, significantly reduce the astonishing high rate of suicide attempts by trans people, which by most measures is about 40%. 40% of trans people have attempted suicide. Every single trans person I know has a suicide plan, 100%. 100%. So that's why I support the work of Equality Virginia. Equality Virginia is working to make Virginia a place where all people, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, have equal protection under the law. Virginia has made huge strides this last year. Danica Rowe became the first transgender, openly transgender person in the nation to hold statewide office. But we have a long ways to go, and the climate nationally is so toxic. Frankly, Transgender people I know are terrified of the future. Terrified. And I think with good reason. We all want to be able to care for our families, be productive members of society, and just live in peace. So I thank you for taking the time to listen to me, and I invite your questions. And let me just say um, that I'm pretty open about things. If I'm not comfortable with the question, I'll just decline to answer it, so don't, don't hold back. 
Um, <clears throat> I believe you are actively involved with a Methodist group. Is that are you are you? Yes, I'm one of the Methodist churches, and I uh, just started going to Farlington. To Farlington. Methodist. Oh yeah. Um, I, my question is, how have the churches you've been involved with or belong to been helpful, and how have they not? Um, without naming names. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so I went. To, I was going to a church, a um, fairly big congregation, and it turned out that they had another transgender member of the congregation who I didn't know until that person's mom showed up at a support group meeting. It's like, oh, what are you doing here? Um, and I'd never heard any LGBT issues raised in that church. But there was an associate pastor I finally felt comfortable coming out to. And I'll probably get choked up when I talk about this. But she was so affirming. And that was the point where I knew, where, when my perspective changed from I might survive this to I'm going to make it. I will survive. Um, and she pulled, a, <laughs> um, she pulled a book off her bookshelf. Um, that had uh, some, some ceremonies for affirming name changes and gender and things like that, which showed me that she'd already been thinking about it. That was huge for me, huge, huge, huge for me. Because um, every week I'd show up in church and there'd be prayer requests. And I'd hear, you know, I'm having this surgery or that surgery or, you know, all these things, and you can't really compare people's concerns, but I'm like, okay, I'm like thinking about hanging myself. <laughs> I would like to ask for prayers on that. Mm -hmm. And I could, I could, just couldn't do that. Um, so to actually have support and, um, of her was, and for the first time in my life, <clears throat> she mentioned, mentioned trans people from the pulp. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I was included. Um, because there's so much that says you're not. There's, you know, I would ask myself, would God have created me just to damn me to hell? Because he made me this way. I, I couldn't see that. So that was huge. Um, she moved to another church. Um, the senior pastor there has been um, supportive, but not openly proactive. So I'm not really, I mean, I'm sort of, like in the middle ground, and so that's, I moved to a church that's explicitly affirming. I, I had a question along, kind of along the same lines. Um, a lot of my friends who are very open-minded and progressive folks, um, and majority African-American friends of mine um, that are involved in church and very um, open-minded, um, are not open-minded on this question. And while they would um, agree with me on many issues um, facing the church, facing society. Uh, they seem to have a very clear line that LGB LGBTQ questions, issues, conversations are an abomination. And I always struggle with how to talk to them about my own perspective. Um, because they they seem like there's just a door that's that's shut, and I was wondering if you had any advice or if other people had advice about how to talk to your Christian friends about being open and welcoming to all people. Well, I haven't really dealt specifically with that question, but I do think that most. Opposition is based off of lack of knowledge. And there's a tendency, there's a lot of really bad junk science out there. A lot of it's being um, propagated by, if you ever hear of uh, anything by a um, so called, it's a former um, professor at George, Johns Hopkins named McHugh, that's been totally debunked. There's now this whole thing of rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is nowhere to be found, not in any peer-reviewed literature, 
not the experience of anybody I know, but it's being propagated as, as a basis for discrimination. Um, there's, a, I think, a conflation of all the different aspects of the LGBTQ community. Um, so I think that maybe some people see the most outrageous things going on at a gay pride parade and think that's the entire community. Um, I think a lot of people just have never taken the time or had the inclination to look into the science. Um, there's there are brain scans and there's hard physical evidence to show that the brains of transgender people more closely resemble the brains of cisgender or non-transgender people of the gender with, with which they identify. So a trans woman like me, my brain scans would more closely resemble a woman and the other woman than they would a man. And it's even more pronounced with transgender men. I think a lot of people don't even realize that there's transgender men. Uh, when you hear these things about the bathroom bills, they say, oh, I, don't want, I don't want men in the bathroom with my daughter. Well, that's exactly what they're going to get if people follow the law. I mean, you, most trans guys are indistinguishable from, from cis men. You know, and a lot of them are like really buff and beards and deep voices. And, you know, some of them have tattoos. I mean, uh, there's Logan Ireland that was in, that's in the Air Force is in the documentary. This guy is like humongously built. And you Probably terrifying if you walked into a women's room. You know? <laughs> but that's what they want. But they don't know because they're not. They don't. They're not thinking about the science and, and the realistic um, aspects of what they're talking about. So there's a lot more and more science. It's, it's the research is growing uh, all the time. But first of all, you have to believe in science to accept it. Um, you know, no one. I don't know trans person that would wish this on anybody, not their worst enemy. I mean, it's the last thing I would want for, it's, it's hard, it's just really hard every single day. So no one's out there recruiting kids, no <laughs> one wants, you know, um, they talk about protection, there's 200 cities, 17 states with uh, public accommodation laws, there hasn't been a single instance of a trans person bothering anybody in the restrooms. There have been, you know, senators and people like that that solicit for sex in the restrooms, but not, they're not trans. Um, that we know of. That we know of. Good point. My, Very good point. My grand, my, I have a grandchild who is a trans man. He's in his early 20s now. He's had some surgery. Um, and he started when he was four. Um, when by the time he was five, he was, um, he had always been an oppositional child when he was a girl. And, um, and by five, he was absolutely refusing to wear girls' clothes, which made my daughter very unhappy because she really liked having a little girl to <laughs> fool with and, you know, dress up. And so it was really plain to the whole family that he was on a different tra trajectory than any other little girl we had ever met. And um, he has more than he has more than one problem, but being transgender doesn't seem to be one of them. And has been um, protected by his two mothers and his school, who, are they, who have fought with the schools to make sure that bathrooms were accessible to everybody. And, um, and he's doing okay. He's for for now. He's doing reasonably okay. And and that's a great point, and, and great for his parents for for recognizing that and supporting him. Because study after study after study show that when kids are supported by their families, when they're treated with dignity and respect, when people have access to public accommodations and, and equal rights under the law, trans people do okay. And the rates of suicide drop down to the average population. So those things are life-saving. That's why it's so important to, to oppose the bigotry and oppose the discrimination and just, you know, just treat everybody equally under the law. Uh, 
those who uh, uh, use the Bible, but more importantly, science, to oppose transgenders and gays, I strongly suggest they read the book, The Gene. Uh, it was part of a women's club here. And that. I was so impressed, I've read it twice now. <laughs> it is, the evidence is overwhelming. <laughs> this is heredity that's taking place. It's not anything else except heredity. And to condemn people because of their heredity is an outrage. We have we got no problems with it is with what we did with the blacks. Now, come on, let's move on. Amen. They, they think that there's something that happens in utero uh, with the hormone wash as um, the fetus is developing. And normally it goes one way, but every once in a while it goes a different way. And they're looking at that as, as a possible um, factor in people being transgender. And it's called the gene. It's called the gene. G-E-N-E. 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 Um, you briefly mentioned the pronoun issue. <laughs> and I wish English had a gender neutral pronoun. Any pronoun. Okay. Like, <laughs> Any pronoun. like so many languages. But for me, I have a hard time with they because I'm so used to it denoting plural. Is there any kind of movement or anything to come up with a good pronoun besides they or them? <laughs> well, I am not as plugged into the gender non-conforming yeah. um, segment of the population yeah. as I probably should be because that's not how I identify. And like I said, you know, we all see through see through things through our own lens, so it's a little bit outside, you know. But it really comes down to what they want. And so, um, this is my friend Laura visiting today. Yes. Yeah. My, um, my child is gender non-conforming, um, currently reclaiming. Uh, feminine pronouns, but we did go through they, and I found they to be, once I got used to it, um, although it was confusing to a number of people when I would use it, um, it's become less and less burdensome, I yeah. suppose, because uh, um, it's being used in the media. Uh, Zay or Za was, was the second most commonly used. How and do you that spell that? Z Okay. Oh, okay. 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 That's all right. Okay. We, I can look at it. We read a book um, in my book club. Um, but it's not. It's not universal. Uh, not a serious science-based book that Ed read, but we read a fiction, young adult fiction mm -hmm. book called George. If anybody's read that, um, about um, a boy, fifth grade boy, that uh, wanted to be their school's putting on Charlotte's Web, and he wanted to be Charlotte. And it was about the struggle between what are boys allowed to do and what are girls allowed to do, and yeah. that Charlotte was in the story traditionally a girl, but if anyone's interested, um, it, it's called George. And uh, I've used it a lot with uh, elementary schoolers because it really presents some of these, they, uh, and then Zah comes up too in that book as oh, well. Okay. Um, right. I think it's a really one of the first maybe kind of mainstream books for kids to talk about some of these issues. Yeah, and a lot of those books are really there's a lot more and more books are coming up. Uh, I just I I um, I'm just wondered if you mind sh sharing with us about your family and how they yeah. um, respond to it. You. Um, you don't uh, care to this. Well. I'm a little bit uncomfortable talking for other people because, you know, you're going to get my perspective of their reaction, which they may see things differently. I'm sure they see things differently. Um, for my spouse and I, it was a struggle. Um, it took a long time uh, to reach a place of acceptance and then move on towards embracing who I am and just what we'd all been through together. Um, it's really one of those uh, situations where, you know, as, as, when a family goes through a struggle, whether it's a medical struggle or something else, and they really put their love first, um, <clears throat> they made us stronger. And I think we have um, a great relationship and a deep love. Uh, my son was, you know, he didn't mention, he didn't say any, any issue. He, he was in high school at the time. At first, 
he wouldn't look at me when I was dressed, and then he got more and more comfortable, and he's just been great ever since. Um, my daughter, a couple months before, a month or so before I uh, actually transitioned, went full time, I, I uh, was just kind of checking in with the kids, and I said, you know, how are you doing? And my daughter said, I'm getting ready to start high school. I have bigger problems than the transgender dad. <laughs> <laughs> So, and that's where we want them to be. <laughs> so, but we're all doing great, and you know. Or did you have a, something else you wanted to? I mean, I, I was just wondering if you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, you go ahead. I, I think Laura has to go off to her. No, I, no I, I'm okay. I just was going to mention one thing I wanted to piggyback on the pronoun. It's also collectives are problematic when you are dealing um, and in. Uh, one collective that has become pretty much, you know, just universal is you guys, referring to people as you guys. Yes. And I'm sure yeah. a lot of, a lot, I, I remember that not all women like to hear that either. But that's, that's a northernism. It's a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, you all is much more. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a hard time with that one. That's one that comes up with me, and I have to constantly police myself. So it, it's not just when some young server comes up to a table full of old ladies yes. like me and says, How are you guys <laughs> doing? Exactly. <laughs> not as well as we I were. <laughs> It was recently brought up to me from a, a, another uh, transgender uh, woman who was a friend of mine that that was something that was just really difficult to hear. And so that's just something that I just to put that out there with the linguistic changes that that came in and now that needs to kind of roll back out. Let's see that go away. <laughs> just, um, let me just kind of tack on to that because for me, especially right after I transitioned. When I got misgendered, it was horrible. It was dead. It took me about three days to recover from that. Um, and people, oh, but I knew you from before. And I was like, well, my dad knew me from before, and he's never gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know? He told me a little bit longer than you have. Wow. <laughs> you know? That's a, that's a great dad. So please, just make the effort. Um, now it's, it's easier to slough off, but uh, for, and, and some people don't have or don't want to present that classic stereotypical gender presentation, you know, to fit that mold. So, you know, sometimes it's a little bit hard to see that person, who they are, by their external appearance. So please just make the effort, that's all I'm saying. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people, I'm not sure who, um, you haven't spoken to. Thank you, Anne, so much for coming and sharing your story with us. It's been very educational and helpful to me, and I know it's not easy for you, but thank you for doing so. Thank I had a question about how much you feel at peace now versus before, and I also was wondering if, uh, you, if you went into a brand new situation, new job, would you ever just attempt to pass for a female and not go into the history, or do you feel that's a betrayal? Well, I think I do pass for female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. But, um, well, for one thing, now I'm I kind of out, and I'm on the internet, and there's things like that, so uh -huh. um, I don't advertise it necessarily, but um, I don't want to hide from it either because mm -hmm. what was so toxic for me was the guilt and the shame and the hiding and stuff. So, and I have nothing to be ashamed of. This is just something that happened to me. It's like, you know, are you ashamed of your hair color or your, you know, how tall you are? Or, I mean, I know some people are, but you can, there's nothing you can, you know, yeah. it's not your fault the way you were born. So, um, I'm tired of worrying about, I'm tired of being being ashamed of it, so I'm, I'm going to talk about it. And when I talk about it in public, it's like taking a big knife and just sticking it right in the shame and the guilt. And, <laughs> you know, and it feels good. So, um, you know, you talk about it at peace, I feel so much more congruent, so much more thing, but the flip side is I don't have that safety net, if you will, of being able to just pass myself off as a guy or whatever, and just kind of that, that normal, I mean, I'm exposed every single day, 
every time I walk out of the house and, you know, there's bad people out there, so. I can tell a kind of a funny story happened to me. I had a very strong father and very strong mother, but I really wished I was a boy when I was growing up. And um, after I was married, I was talking to my husband one day, and I said, you know, I really resented being a girl. When I was about 13 or 14, it seemed like the guys had so much more oh, yeah. going uh -huh. for them. Yeah, well, now, now that I'm in my 80s, you know, back in the 50s, it was a whole different story. And uh, I, I said, did you ever have any problems like that? He looked at me and he said, no. He said, my mother told me I was a boy and I believed. <laughs> I thought that's how simple it is. Oh, guys. Yeah. My mom told me I was a boy and I believed her. <laughs> um, could you tell us about some advocacy opportunities? Like what what steps can we take? Um, well, pretty much every school has and, and y'all can help me out. Um, pretty much every school has a they used to call them Gay Street Alliance, now they're called something else. I can't remember what what the more current so term is. Still, we'll call them GSAs, but yeah, not all. They, they they can have them in Fairfax County every high school, but many of them don't. It's reliant on the kids starting it up and having a sponsor in your school. Yeah, so and if your school, if you have children that are, are they won't have it in the middle schools and they won't have it in the elementary. Advocating at the local level is really important. Um, you know, in the schools, making sure that the policies are inclusive and respectful of all people. Obviously, there's uh, advocacy at the state and national political levels. Um, there are a number of, there's like PFLAG and a number of other groups that support, um, they're primarily for, mem for family members of, uh, you know, LGBTQ people, um, but they also welcome allies. Um, and there's basically just, you know, talking to your friends, talking to your neighbors, talking to other people, um, and just creating an awareness of, you know, the fact that we're not out to convert people or cause problems. We just want to live our lives and just be left alone. You know, kind of as a joke, people talk about the gay agenda or the trans agenda. Yeah. And this. I said, well, you know, let's see, what's on my trans agenda for today? Cut the grass, <laughs> go to Walmart. Yeah. You know, do the dishes, that kind of stuff. So, um, and Equality Virginia, I have really gotten a lot of support out of working with them, and uh, it's really made an impact in the last year. And Blair, a, a friend of mine, actually former neighbor, who's in the Virginia Senate now, first openly gay man in the Virginia Senate named Adam Eben, represents the 30th district in Northern Virginia, maybe you know Adam. Um, lived next to him for years and then he went on to great things and is very plugged into some of these issues if you want to join his Facebook page or, or uh, sign up for his updates. He, he updates a lot of these uh, legislation that he introduces. In our church level, it was actually our daughter was a suggested part of our renovation we should have a gender neutral bathroom. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. So at least one place. So it can be a family, whatever you name it, the family can go, the different age, multi-generational, is necessary. They, feel, they kind of people can go in, you know, with the elderly and young people. Yeah. Everybody yeah. grows up in and their then, own home. <laughs> and, um, so and that using in the body. That's something yes. we can do very much in our church right now. That, that's a great point, too, because, you know, you can advocate at your place of employment, your social organizations that you're in. And I would also urge, you know, if you're thinking about this, to expand that advocacy for other people too. Um, you know, there's so many people in, and we're getting, as, as our population becomes more and more diverse, we're getting more and more sensitive to other cultures, other people's perspectives, and we're seeing things that would never occur to maybe the people in this room, but are a big deal for people, you know, in another situation. So how can we be more inclusive? How can we be more supportive of each other? You know, just across the board. I don't know how we're doing on time. If we we are. You, you're reading my mind because I know you wanted to get a picture. So oh, yeah. I better. Uh, and if anybody wants to do, thanks so much. This was awesome.
want to get a picture up there, or what would you prefer? Um, where would the lights going to be good, I guess? 